Welcome to the Columbia Alumni Leaders Experience. Uh, Kale is a series of virtual programs designed to provide leadership development as well as collaboration and camaraderie among alumni volunteers. My name is Shelly Smith. I am a graduate of the law school 1988 and president of the Columbia University Alumni Club of Chicago. I'm also part of the Associations and Clubs Kale Subcommittee, which is a group of 20 alumni leaders from around the world who've worked to ensure you have a wonderful Kale experience. We thank you for your volunteering and leadership with the CAA Regional Alumni Clubs and Shared Interest Groups. We uh, also want to encourage you right up front to register for all of the Kale programs across the remaining three weeks, especially there are exclusive programs created for club and SIG alumni leaders. There will be three Kale closing programs offered on Thursday, November 10th at 8 a.m., 12 p.m., and 6 p.m on developing and mentoring future alumni leaders. Now I'm excited to introduce the presenters for this session, John Malervi, uh, class of 2000, SEAS, a CAA board member and immediate past president of CAA Boston. Also Armand Adams, class of 2006, Columbia College, co-chair of Real Estate Network of CAA. They are both eager to share their insights with you tonight. John Malervi is <clears throat> the firmware engineering manager at Instron, a manufacturer of test equipment designed to evaluate the mechanical properties of materials and components. He's been an engineer with a variety of technical companies, including Hubbard One and Teradyne. John has an MS in computer science from Boston University and an MS in electrical engineering from Columbia, where he prominently involved, he was prominently involved rather with the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Armand Adams is a licensed real estate salesperson with the Corcoran Group. Before Corcoran, he was a founding member of Skyward real estate located in New York City. In his first year with the firm, he received the Transaction of the Year Award. Armand is also President Emeritus of the Black Alumni Council of Columbia University. He recently received the Columbia Alumni Medalist Award, Columbia's highest award for alumni. He resides in East Harlem and coaches Little League Baseball for Harlem and East Harlem. So, Maya, would you like to? Uh, yes. Take thank it you. Away? So, <laughs> thank you so much, Shelley. Appreciate that, and thank you all for joining tonight. I just want to go over a few things before we start the session. Tonight's session is being recorded, um, so feel free to keep your camera on, or but please just stay muted uh, so that way we can hear our uh, speakers clearly. Speaker view, we find, is the best way to experience uh, our sessions. And we would really appreciate hearing from you. If you have questions or comments, please uh, use our chat feature at the bottom. And we will make sure that um, any questions or comments will be uh, addressed at the end of the program. Um, thank you, John and Armand, for, for joining uh, us this evening. Or um, I'm not sure if we have anybody that's in the morning time, but uh, thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. How about we start off with um, your thoughts, John, on what it means to be the rising leader um, in this organization. Thank you for everyone for the introduction. And thank you for calling in for what is tonight for me in Massachusetts. So last year at Cal, <clears throat> or was in Leaders Weekend, I gave a talk on why everyone should quit volunteering but I didn't take my own advice. And, but that's why we're here is to create organizations that can survive one leader moving on for whatever reason. So what Armand and I call the rising leader is someone who's just starting volunteering. And many leaders will never get beyond this point and that's fine. 
And one thing you should also note is very often we hear new volunteers rising. Sometimes think it's a young alumni. It need not be. It could be someone any phase of life or their career when they get involved with the club. And then they have to have the conversation. If you're a rising leader, how hard, hard do you want to rise? Many just want to be a board member. In Boston, we had a gentleman who just ran bowling events every year, and that's all he wanted to do. But he did it well, but never wanted to be president. And that's fine. But those who are interested in advancement should talk to the current leadership. And if you are the current leader, you should be talking to people who seem interested and have conversations about succession in public and private to see who, who is truly interested and then see if they follow up. Because words are cheap, but who is actually volunteering for events? Who is actually showing up at board meetings? Who is, who is coming up with new ideas? And then be clear on when someone is volunteering to take a step up, what they are signing up for. Do they have the time in their life after their family and career to do it? And you know, challenge them to really think, do you wanna do this? And some people may turn away at that point and respect that decision. You know, they're doing you, every, the organization a favor if they realize they can't follow up. But those who do follow up on their commitments will be your, you'll be your leaders of the next <clears throat> few years and decades. Now, Armand, what are your thoughts? Thank you. Uh, so thank you, John, for passing on. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. Uh, I want to talk to talk about this subject from a different perspective, from a rising leader myself, but as John mentioned, looking for rising leaders as well. Um, I remember when I first joined the Black Alumni Council, I was coming out of college, just graduated uh, out of Columbia College. And I actually was the uh, senior liaison for um, the BSO, the Black Student Organization. And uh, basically one of my major roles was actually putting on Black graduation. And what I did is I brought in uh, members of the Black Alumni Council to give the, the senior toast. And uh, I happened to know two of the uh, members because they were uh, seniors at the time when I was a, a sophomore and junior. So they came and, and they gave the toast and they said, oh, you know, you're graduating. Look like you'd be a great member for a Black Alumni Council. I said, sure. So, uh, you know, with me staying in the city, I came in and I, they immediately, you know, within a couple of months, they said, hey, we need a secretary. Do you want to be a part of it? And again, having that great energy, uh, again, because I saw that it was a great opportunity to network and be a part of something that continues something that I left from college. I, I felt like I had a great opportunity to network and, and be part of a community while in college. And I felt like this is only just a, a great transition, uh, graduating, being part of the Black Alumni Council and continuing that um, rapport and continue that community. So I uh, became, a sec became a secretary. And then about a year in, uh, the president, who again uh, was named Kwame Adu, he was a senior when I was a, a sophomore, he, was, he let me know that he was going to business school. And I said, oh, okay, so Jessica, who was the vice president, who also was in, in, in college at the time, um, I said, oh, so she's gonna become president. He said, no, she's going to law school. So I said, so who's gonna become president? And he kept looking at me and I kind of like turned around and see who is he staring at? <laughs> so that uh, was my opportunity to become president. And, and I, I see that, you know, they saw something in me as a rising leader and uh, it was a great opportunity to become part of the organization. And as I rose, at one point, it was uh, just myself and Courtney Wilkins, um, who was CCO7, that was part of it. And then eventually I brought in one of my uh, classmates, um, Chris Jones, who eventually became the vice president. And Courtney uh, happened to also move to California. So it was just Chris Jones and I. And I saw opportunities to get people who involved. Um, at the time, we also were becoming a, formerly a organization that was Columbia College-based and we were becoming a university-wide organization, I felt it was important to not only find rising leaders um, just within your own community, but outside your community. Because again, if you are becoming university-wide, you need to represent that university-wide. So, you know, becoming recruiting and going to different um, events, especially, you know, events like Cal uh, Leaders Weekend and other Columbia alumni events allowed you to meet people and, and say, hey, you know, are you in New York? Would you, you know, you seem to be involved. Do you want to be part of Black Alumni Council? And, and, and as John mentioned, finding, you know, not throwing everything right on them at the time, but finding limited, uh, finding opportunities for them just to ease them in. Um, 
And then, you know, as I graduated, being part of, uh, still being remaining part of the, uh, involved with the BSO, future senior, rising seniors, I would again, reach out to them and saw their involvement, knowing their involvement within school and, and you know, their eagerness to be part of this community as well, looking for those opportunities. But also now that I've become part of, now I'm the co-chair of RENSA, which is the Real Estate Network of Columbia Alumni Association, it's finding again, that opportunity to, again, we're becoming a university-wide organization. It just can't be people that I know in my community who happen to be in real estate. And we've actually been able to recruit some great um, alumni in other schools. Uh, GSAP, one of our, our, my board members is from GSAP and he has been great in not only creating ideas for events, being involved, but also recruiting other uh, members of his GSAP community and he even recruited someone from the business school um, who's also been a great community, a great part of the community and great part of the board and it's put on some great events. So it's definitely, I, I think, important to look for opportunities where, you know, you find rising leaders from a, a youth perspective, because it's always great to have that youthful energy, but also finding people from, from as diverse as possible, you know, from different schools, um, people with different roles or different careers, wherever the organization you happen to be in, you know, finding that niche. And, and, and trying to find ways to fulfill that niche. Thank you so much, Ramon. That was great. And I've had the pleasure of knowing you since you started that journey. <laughs> so, so that was great. Um, could you speak a little bit about your feelings towards what it's like when you um, are at that peak leadership uh, role and, and, and kind of filling that role to its you know, during that state in your in your volunteering. Yes. So, and forgive me, guys. I'm going to obviously overlap a little bit from what I've said before to kind of what you know different you know future topics. Um, but I would say, and Mike, when I was president of the Black Alumni Council, it was important to. Uh, we were at a time again, as I touched on, come university wide, but pre before Kwame, who was a couple of years older than me. We actually had uh, alums who were a little, old, a little more seasoned, I would say, um, and they ran the organization in a way that, not to, and I'm not saying it negatively, but wasn't representing the current um, environment. And, and and what I mean by that, to you know, continue what, to make my point, uh, we uh, didn't have a website, we didn't have Facebook, um, we didn't have a certain account set up. So I, I felt it was important you know, in my, in my role that what can we do to advance ourselves and, and to become with the times in a sense. So it was important to uh, you know, get these, again, again, our social media accounts, get our website set up, um, find ways, to how, what other facets can we do to increase our Black alumni scholarship? Um, and then segueing to my current role now as co-chair of um, RENSA, uh, this is something that I was is completely new to me, coming from a role of um, Black Alumni Council. Again, again, even though I was very young in that role, and then finding ways to become a leader uh, and advance myself from a youth perspective to more of a you know seasoned person. Now I'm starting an organization from scratch. Uh, Renta is about about two years old now, um, and uh, thankfully with CAA and, and particularly uh, Jenna. Uh, they had the trust in myself and my other co-chair, Michael Sin, to say, you know what, we're going to trust you to create a brand new organization. And doing so, it's finding, you know, having the experience of the previous uh, things we've done with uh, the Columbia Alumni Association and, and being part of BAC, but also having the experience of being involved in organizations like, you know, being part of activities like Cal and, you know, going to these sessions and learning how to organize, what to do to strategize, to have a, a, a fulfilled board, have a um, planning, having a, a calendar set up. So, you know, that's one thing that's been a, a challenge in a sense as well is, you know, finding, starting from scratch, but maintaining a consistent organization. Again, um, again, having the calendar set up, making sure you're not only creating um, great events, but diverse events that's going to keep people interested. You can't just have a networking happy hour all the time. Um, what, you know, we just recently had women in real estate event um, that I felt went really well. 
before that we had a real estate tour. Um, so it's been great getting these different voices involved and uh, finding ways again to increase the calendar. But what other things can we do to continue to advance and, and, and look towards the future of the organization? Uh, and then I'm gonna uh, pass this on to John and get his thoughts on this as well. John, can't, can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I... Thank you. Uh, anyway, um, when, it, when it comes to peak leadership, it isn't just being a SIG or club president. I think it's VP or maybe the title doesn't even matter, heavy involvement. For myself, I think I spent the most hours ever volunteering for Columbia during the nation builder rollout well, six or seven years ago than I did when I was actually the club president. So I would say I would call, quantify myself as a peak leader from them until I stepped down as CA Boston president. So I think, you know, you, you know what you're doing when you're a peak leader, depending on what your role. But one way to not burn yourself out and create a stable organization is to delegate, delegate, delegate. You know, pass stuff on. If you get promoted from VP to president, make sure the new VP is doing stuff instead of the president just to consuming everything. Because we've seen many non-sustainable clubs where everything's done by one or two people and then they move on and the club just kind of loses coherence. And instead by passing along, they'll take it along and then at a peak, you have to know, you know, show someone on the ropes. Year one, you do it with them. Year two, you watch them do it. Year three, you're, you're moved on, but that's the next segment. Another thing is when you, should, when you are the president, you shouldn't always know who your successor is. That could change during your term. But you should always be able to point to this person could take over tomorrow and this other person could take over in an emergency. And ideally, you know who the president's the successor successor is, if you're lucky to have a good enough pipeline. And one other thing I would encourage people as they rise up in leadership to peak is know how long your commitment is. Some clubs have fixed terms, and then that is a convenient. You're president for three years and that's it. But clubs that are looser is know what you're doing it for. For myself, um, Boston has one year term. So I said, I, when I got elected, I was gonna do it for four years. Um, and I ended up only doing it for three because of the birth of my second child. But I knew when I started, I was not gonna be a decade long president. I was just gonna make my impact, do my best and then move on and pass on. And fortunately, when I had a step down early, um, my successor was ready to go and I was able to pass on the baton pretty effortlessly and he's done a great job and then next time i'll talk about how to be the, the, the path leader when someone else is running the organization and, and how to run that i'm just going to quickly i'm sorry jump in and say i, I just want to double down on that with what john uh said just definitely uh making sure you delegate and and identify people to not only help but also to again take on the leadership as well uh you know just briefly adding to that when I started an organization, I knew I couldn't do this all alone. And I identifying, you know, I, I had about maybe a handful of people and then uh, just kind of in the process of starting an organization, Jenna and I identified a few more people and I knew we had to get more people involved. Cause again, it was all, I would easily get burnt out. I feel sometimes even burnt out with having a full board. So, you know, making sure you have people involved and, you know, I would say maybe out of the 10 or so people that initially were, I reached out to um, five remain active. Uh, and, and that was expected. You know, I, I didn't have the intention of going after five and, and expecting five to be involved. Um, I knew people were gonna drop off because some of them weren't involved in NCA in before. I know this is, it, it is an, a, a transition for people who were never involved before to be in the CA space. Uh, you know, it, it is a, a, a quiet taste, uh, I guess, a lack of a better a phrase, um, to, to remain involved with CA, to, to whatever role you're in, whatever organization you're in, to maintain that activity, especially knowing like, hey, this is not a, this is a volunteer job. This is not a job you're getting paid for. So it's going to take your energy and time. So it's finding those people. And again, you're, they're going to have people that's going to drop off, drop off. But I, you know, having that expectation and identifying that. Thank you, Armand. John, you, um, you're kind of our resident expert in being a, a, an emeritus leader and what that looks like and what it means. Um, could you just go into a little bit what it means for you um, and share your, your thoughts on that? Um, I think one thing is, you know, no, leave enough so they miss you. You know, um, 
some people, it's, it's to be fair to the next cohort of leaders, um, you know, make sure to give them room to breathe, to breathe and do their own things. Um, as, as I uh, passed the baton, if you will, I told my successor, he had permission to tell me to shut up or tell me to leave, no questions asked, whenever he felt I was in the way. He, that hasn't come up yet, but I felt it was important to give him the reign to do that. Um, and that comes also in a more smaller case of, you know when to talk and know when to be silent. And there have been times um, when, fortunately, our communications are mostly electronic. So, you know, I'm an email or a WhatsApp, and I start typing a reply, and then I delete the answer because the new leadership's doing something different than I would. If I would have went north, they're going west. But it's a perfectly fine idea, and I don't say anything. At the same time, they, they know how to reach me, and they have asked me questions. How do you do this? It could be technical stuff, a nation, nation builder, or advice on how, you know, are you... <clears throat> how to do this or that. And just because you're an emeritus leader with one club doesn't mean you're an emeritus leader from Columbia. For, in my own case, I'm on the CA board and will be the 2023. So by stepping away from one role, they will focus my volunteer energy on another role. And, and that's the way, you know, Armand you know, was involved with one organization, now he's in another. And again, you know, volunteer organizations are, sh or can, are shorter than careers. So you very easily can spin back around. You know, you could, Imagine, you know, maybe I'll be the elder statesman running being the club president in 2040. I don't know. Um, but you should um, always be available and primarily always, you know, not be there, but be available. That's my, that's my thought. And Armand, what do you think? I love the phrase, make sure you do enough to make, the, make sure, I'm sorry, I'm not going to paraphrase right. Make sure they miss you a little bit when, when you leave. I love that because I still sometimes, uh, you know, uh, watch over the shoulder BAC, like, hey guys, like, <laughs> like, I'm here in case you have a question, you know, like, how's it going? Is it, uh, so I wanna, you know, but to your point though, as much as you want that, you still want to be able to step away. Um, uh, similar to John, um, before I became part of RINSA, I transitioned from being uh, president of BAC to also being on the CA board as well during that that time. So I was still, you know, very much involved in the CA community, but again, you know, taking that step back from the BAC, but still being involved. I, I went to um, all the events, um, majority of the meetings. Uh, actually, Kevin Matthews, uh, the former president at the time, actually even created a role for, to be on the board as, uh, advisor slash president emeritus. That's actually what the role. And I, I thought that was great because he, he realized, you know, it, it takes a village, uh, sometimes the past village. And it wasn't just even my insight or, or, or Chris Jones's insight. He had uh, Judd Greenway, and George Van Absen as advisors who were past presidents and, you know, very much esteemed leaders uh, who were um, involved and, and, and kind of basically were the founding members and, and laid a tremendous groundwork for the BAC. And I think it's important to incorporate and advise. And, and I did so with those leaders as well, uh, reached out to them, got their thoughts. Um, and I felt it's important to do so as well. You know, not right now, it is a little bit of a harder transition to be remain as involved as I was before, now being a leader in another organization. But, um, you know, more so speaking towards that, that, trend, that time period of you know, being on CA board and just kind of stepping away. I felt it was important, again, to be involved. But again, just kind of from an out, outlook, be available for our questions they asked. I definitely got a lot of emails about, hey, what's the password to the bank account? Or, you know, who's, who, who's the past treasurer? Whose name is on this? You know, things like that. You know, it's those little things I was available for. But also, you know, I remember one particular situation where, again, also being involved in the CA board, uh, it was approaching me where what was where we might've been kind of somewhat of a, let's say a, 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 a wall or kind of a, like, let's say dead end um, with a scholarship uh, where, you know, we were uh, raising money, but how could we take it to the next level? And I felt great that I was able to step in um, and, you know, set up a meeting with the current, um, the current board and, you know, get some of the old fundraisers involved and said, well, what can we do? What, what happened in the past that we, we can kind of duplicate in the present, and we were able to raise, take it past that level in regards to fundraising. 
And, you know, not that I, I feel like I want, I took credit for that per se, but it did feel great that I was able to kind of come in as almost like a consultant or, or advisory role and, you know, be kind of a, a deal maker in a sense uh, to set up that meeting, to, to advise and, and to get some of the, the right players involved to be able to, again, take it to that next level. And even now, again, I, even though I said, I, I feel like I'm not as involved um, as a, with my current role, I still get, you know, the current board with Riley, you know, they, they do reach out to me and have questions, get their, get insight on certain things. And I, I do, I, I feel honored to be able to feel that they can reach out to me. And I, I do give my thoughts on it because I, I do know kind of how things go uh, and, and how things have gone in the past and just knowing that, hey, you know, these are the two, these are the two ideas you have, or this is the idea you have, you know, what would be the scenarios? And I would give them my input of, you know, this is how kind of things have happened in the past. This is the probably the scenario you're gonna get with this, and this is gonna be the scenario you're gonna get with that. So uh, I have been able to advise, and I feel like it is important, you know, to not completely step away. Um, and I'll, and again, I'll always go to all events. It's not just going to events, but I'll still always be involved. But, you know, again, it's finding that, that happy medium of, of, of between the two. I also want to add on something Armand said is one part of that succession and being walking away is make sure you have the list of all the technical passwords, all the legal stuff, all the financial stuff, which in general, I think at least two people should know all that stuff anyway. But, um, you know, have a folder or where, encrypted file and hand it off to the next people. And you'll probably forget to hand something and they'll call you up and that's but it's good to, um, you know, it doesn't walk with one person to have an organization be sustainable. I agree, John. I, I think what, um, what I'm taking from what you just said is that uh, it's, even though you may have the title, the job is usually more than just one person being involved. Do you find that that's, that's the case? And um, I'm gonna definitely open it up for questions. So please feel free to uh, either raise your hand or put your question in the chat. But um, one of the things I'm just curious in for either one of you or both of you to uh, make some comments on is how in this virtual world where we're not um, in having the opportunity to meet in person, um, the challenge of finding new leadership is gonna be pretty difficult in, in, this, in this coming year. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions or things that you, you think would help clubs and our SIGs um, maintain relationships with people to get them in these leadership uh, positions in the future? That's a good question. So I'm gonna let John answer that while I think about it. <laughs> I have to throw you under the bus there, John. Yeah, I know. Um, well, I guess part of it is, you know, think of leaders who maybe people who are interested but couldn't do it because of geography. Geography doesn't matter anymore. So if someone works in the suburbs and they can't come to downtown Boston or your city, um, virtual event, they can do a lot. And maybe that's how they get involved. And I, I would suspect that, you know, in the post-pandemic world, will probably always be a virtual component now. So, you know, get people involved that way. See who answers. Use this chance for renewal. Maybe there are people who are on every virtual event. Reach out to them. See if they're interested in helping out. Do they have ideas for virtual events? You know, and, um, you know, make sure you get, you know, contact, email, text message, your medium of choice. You know, and then whenever we can have in-person events, throw a really big event. Uh, thing, uh, to John's point, I agree. Um, I think it's definitely important to diversify in regards to reaching out to uh, as many people as possible because it's no longer just, you know, again, for Rinsa, starting off here, we are uh, a, a New York based organization, but we don't have to be. Um, you know, it's real estate network could be for anyone. And, and, you know, when I envision Rinsa, I, I imagine it, you know, starting uh, kind of locally, but opening it up, eventually having a Los Angeles uh, sector and having a, a, a Los Angeles group or, or and having a Chicago or, you know, Boston, wherever it may be. So, you know, this is the opportunity to do so. I do have some people who want, reached out actually through the SoCal 
to say, hey, they wanted to put on something in regards to real estate. And, and again, having these connections and working with other organizations, you know, especially through Cal, uh, the Cal leader, uh, through Cal, uh, Cal um, the SoCal president and, um, and vice president reached out to me and said, hey, you know, is this something you want to partner on? So, you know, we have someone in, in Los Angeles now. Um, I wouldn't be so quick to just say, okay, they're going to start the organization, but start off by having them put on an event, seeing how their involvement. Um, and I, to also my point I was going to make, and John can actually uh, touch on it a little bit, it's all about programming as well. Uh, to put on large, engaging programming, um, you're going to get people interested and want to be involved. And we've had some programming over the course, the virtual program over the course of, you know, since this has started, where people have reached out actually via email to our, our email address, our rental email address. Hey, um, how can I get involved? How can I be part of the, the organization? And we even had one email say, hey, how, how can I be on the board? Um, I, I think there will probably be challenges where, you know, in the past you would find ways to kind of vet them in a sense, uh, you know, having them come to events, maybe having them do certain tasks to show that they are committed where they're not just gonna fall off or, you know, you help, you have, you're expecting to plan an event and you don't hear from them. You know, there's those little things like, oh, can you help us? You know, we're taking turns doing sign, uh, check-in. we you be able to do that? So things like that, we don't quite have anymore. So that's gonna probably be a challenge is how do we, you know, virtually vet them in a sense, um, but it is still a, a great challenge to have in the sense that we have people that wanna be a part of it. So uh, it, it's a great thing to do, but like, like I said, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see going forward, you know, how you get those people to stay involved from a virtual standpoint. That's great. Thank you so much for that. I'm gonna open it up for anybody that might have any questions. Um, like I said, you can ask your question in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself and, and ask directly. Oh, looks like I have one uh, question from uh, Janet, who's in New Jersey. Um, what types of activities in your clubs generate the largest rate of participation and encourage more participation in other club activities and stickiness? I think it's cohesiveness. I'm sorry, the second part was how to... Encourage participation in other uh, club activities. So I think um, speaking to like kind of cross-pollinating between club and maybe SIG activities. And I know, Amarn, you, you have some experience you just uh, mentioned about, you know, working with the SoCal club and BAC and such, so. Yeah, our, uh, you know, for RENSA particularly, um, <laughs> our biggest events have been the social networking. I, I think with it being new and, and people not quite sure and, and, and us being able to reach out to people who with real estate background, not really understanding, you know, who we are, what's going on. They find a great op op opportunity to come and just meet and network where they don't feel kind of like they're tied to doing anything from a sitting, listening to something or, or doing something. Um, but it's great because that's how we built that network and, and build that kind of, I guess, trust and understanding of who we are, you know, that they can benefit from this, learn from this, network from this, that, we, you know, then you eventually have great opportunities from programming. So. You know, we've had some, now that we've gotten people from other organizations or other schools and like GSAP was a big opportunity for people in, in real estate and the business school. Uh, we've done more events catered to that specific market. Uh, we, we might do something like investing. Um, you'll see that larger group of participants be from those different schools because it's more catering to what they're addressing. Um, so the second part, I would say, you know, touching on, on that part, but also um, working with other organizations, for example, um, you know, we work when we, we might do something with uh, Blacks in real estate, and that would be something, a great opportunity to uh, do a, a co-share, co-sponsorship with the Black Alumni Council, um, working with other organizations where we can network, um, do something, our next event, maybe doing something with uh, the first generation. We talked about doing. We talked about an event uh, with first gen uh, special interest group where we can do something focused on real estate. So find a great opportunity. I think also to build your organization by doing these co sponsorships. So I think it's great opportunities. And you know, even you know, I mentioned like a SIG, but 
whether it even be, you know, to, to from Janet in Jersey, like having a, 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 a New York, I mean, a New Jersey real estate event. Um, you know, we've had some members of, of our organization who actually live in Jersey who come into our the city for events. So, you know, to have something more catered towards their neighborhood, um, it, it'd be a great opportunity. So it, it's just being creative and, and finding ways to, to reach out. Because again, that, again, that helps build your organization when you can expand it by working with other SIGs or other groups. That's great. Um, I think before we do some breakouts, one of the things that is top of mind for myself and I know has come up in some of these um, sessions is uh, your thoughts on making sure your group recruits diverse leaders. Um, how, how have you both kind of tackled that in your tenure with the CAA? I'll, I'll touch on that. I'll, I'll, if John has anything to add in. Uh, I feel like I've kind of touched on a little bit of uh, both that with BAC and um, uh, RENSA. Uh, you know, BAC, again, as I took over at BAC president, we were doing that transition to become a university-wide organization. And I felt it was very important to have a representation of uh, all the different schools, uh, teacher's college, um, business school, law school, um, and then also having different years. Uh, you know, it's, it's somewhat known, um, or at least uh, amongst that commu this community, uh, the AC community, that the classes of uh, seven, 60s and 70s didn't have the best experience at Columbia. So they, didn't re they weren't really involved, and they actually were doing their own thing. Um, they had a, a, a event called Jam, uh, where it was uh, the classes of the, the late 60s and early 70s that would go to different cities and have a bigger group and getting you know some of those leaders of that to be involved with BAC and uh, you know that becoming a, a, a co-event where BAC was then involved. Um, so I think it's important incorporating different classes, different years where they have that, especially when you have something with that wisdom and insight from the older years. With RENSA, I mean, I, I felt it was very important from the, the get-go that the, the mission of, of RENSA was to be as diverse as possible uh, from no matter what uh, school you went to, no matter what class you were in, and no matter what real estate sector, whether it be you know real estate law, real estate finance, commercial or, or, or architecture or residential real estate. Um, and then we want to have as diverse programming as possible where, you know, again, we and so far we've done that with you know, women in real estate. Um, we've done uh, real estate tours, um, virtual and in person. We went to Hudson Yards and uh, one of our board members put that together. So I, I, th I think the only way to truly be successful is to be diverse um, and, and just diverse across the board in no matter what spectrum. So uh, I, I think that's a, a very important factor, um, especially at least in, in the things that I've done or been involved in with BAC and, and then RINSA. Let me just add, I think, for at least for the regional club in Boston, this particular, um, our board members come from our event attendees. So you need events that appeal to a diverse population and all the various axes of diversity um, to get diverse board members. And another part of diversity, if I'm just going to stretch the term a bit, is you always want some people who are on the way in and some people on the way out on the board. Because that way you get the nice churn that keeps a, um, an organization viable. And it also, going back to the topic of this meeting, it keeps the pipeline of leaders flowing. That's great. Thank you so much. So at this time- um, I have a question. Question? Okay, great. Yes. Sorry if this was touched on. My service is really choppy because I'm driving at the moment. But um, just to the notion of like board members being event attendees, have you guys ever considered or done an actual like recruitment or cultivation event specifically with like recruiting people to the board in mind? I've actually um, was discouraged that and I think the, the, uh, the pre my predecessors suggested I think is right is a lot of people say they want to volunteer they click the box nation builder and we had one kind of coming out come out to have a couple drinks recruitment event anyway and one person followed up after that. So I think it's more about showing up. I'm not sure how that rule applies in the virtual era, but 
uh, see who shows up and maybe give them a volunteer role before they're officially a board member. And then you start recruiting them. Yeah, uh, we've thought about prior, you know, prior to the pandemic, uh, we thought about how to increase the board. You know, as I mentioned, we, you know, had to start off with a bunch of people and then kind of dropped off um, about half, which was again expected, but we felt how do we continue to increase the board? Because again, it's all about uh, taking off some responsibility from everyone, but also, you know, thinking about succession in the future. So we were thinking, how can we increase the board? Um, we thought about having an open roll call in the sense of people reach out, we saw sending email to people who participated. Um, and then what kind of uh, vetting we can do, you know, having maybe uh, them have a somewhat interview process, but we've never had specific events. Um, we, excuse me, we've mentioned things at, at, at events like, hey, and, and we plan to, to do that going forward. You know, unfortunately, the pandemic, we weren't able to do that the way we wanted to with, you know, actual events, you know, announce, having an announcement. Um, and it's something we still could do virtually, but, you know, that, that plan was just to, you know, say, you know, hey, we're open to creating a board, uh, I mean, to, to adding people to the board, uh, reach out to us if, you, if you're interested, but it was never a specifically targeted event. It looks like a few comments that um, Stephen said in London has done an open board with some success. Um, I'm I'm happy to chat about that. I, I didn't realize we'd be on camera, so I'm not camera ready as it's almost midnight here in London. <laughs> um, so the past few years, and this is actually came out of a leadership weekend, was that London has started doing at least once a year an open board. And what we do is we just invite anybody that's interested in learning more about what we're doing as an organization to come and join. Uh, and, and just sort of, we, it's not really a pitch as much as it is just sort of an update, an annual update. But from that is we ask if anybody's interested in leading or um, organizing an event that might be uh, particularly uh, personal to them. So I think John, you'd mentioned somebody just did bowling events. And from our open board, um, we have somebody that just does tennis events. Um, so she plans three or four of those just over the course of the year. And that's all she wants to do. And that's fine. That's, that's one less thing that Courtney and I have to, to manage. Uh, we've also gotten somebody to uh, lead CVC uh, and, and start the London chapter, uh, someone to help with social media, someone to do some of our um, arts and, and theater type uh, events um, when we were still meeting in person. So we found it to be a, a good recruitment tool just to, to gauge interest. Um, and hopefully from that, we'll use it as a feeder to, to other positions. Um, so again, it, it really depends on the, the club and, and the region that you're in, if, if that would be a successful pathway. Thanks, Stephen. And I want to clarify that my question was, I missed part of what Armand said because internet, but um, part of the my question and the reason I asked it is because I feel like a lot of times, particularly with SoCal, um, when we think about expanding the board or diversifying or finding new people to be in that pipeline for leadership, it can be really difficult because we're pulling from our own networks and um, you don't always know great people who could be on the board um, just because there are so many, we have like 11,000 people in Nation Builder or something absurd like that. So we can't know all 11,000 people and we can't know their level of interest or capability. So I was just curious if there were um, other ways that people were finding people outside of their own circles who could potentially be in that um, pipeline for succession. So thank you. Thanks, Courtney. That was great. At this time, um, I have set up some uh, breakout rooms for you all to uh, get a, a chance to, to have some conversations, maybe share um, anything that you've learned throughout Kale so far, or if you have questions um, for Armand or John, you can um, you can you can ask in this case. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to put you out in the breakout rooms, and then we'll come back and, and close out. Thank you so much. We'll join again in a moment.
I love Nick's model photo there. Hey, hey. Just trying to make sure I, everybody that uh, should have joined, joined to have a good conversation or at least uh, start one. We know that the, the time constraints doesn't give us as uh, optimal of a situation as we would have if we were in person, like Armand and Steve said, where we could uh, share um, you know, our stories and drinks and, and such. But uh, hopefully this will, this will be um, in the past and we'll get to spend time with each other in, in the new year. Um, I want to just take this opportunity if anybody has any last comments or questions before we close out the program. Um, Armand and John, thank you so much for, for sharing uh, all that you shared with us this evening. Um, you gave us a lot to think about um, in terms of just the different uh, points of view that a, that a leader has throughout their time. Um, John, you mentioning that even though you may not be the president of, of the, the club you originally started your journey, there are other opportunities to, to share and, and, and engage with the Columbia University family. And, and I think that was a really um, important thing to, to keep in mind. So with that, I, I want to thank you both. I want to thank everybody on this Zoom for joining us. We really appreciate it. This has been a journey. We have one more week of, of Kale celebrating, um, but it has truly been a pleasure seeing all of you um, each week join in for the programs that you have. Um, so I want to thank everybody. Thank you, everyone, and, and thank, uh, thank you, CA staff, uh, Mia, Alyssa, uh, <laughs> Nick, <laughs> uh, everyone for helping put this together. I really appreciate this, and, and this has been great. Uh, you know, I wasn't sure how this was going to be, you know, versus being in person, but you guys have been a great job making this, you know, virtual. Yeah, well, and thank everyone. Um, I pass second all those thanks, and thank you all, all who um, virtually attended and giving us an hour of your time this evening or morning or afternoon, depending where you are. And um, have a good rest of your day or night. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Ciao.